You're listening to Family Talk, the radio broadcasting division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I am that James Dobson, and I'm so pleased that you've joined us today. The following program is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Well, welcome to today's edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and for the past couple of days here on the program, our co-host, Dr. Tim Clinton, has been talking with Chad Robichaud. On this third and final installment of their conversation, Chad will be sharing the rest of his testimony, his experience of having PTSD, and his ministry through the Mighty Oaks Foundation. Chad Robichaud is a highly decorated former U.S. Marine and Department of Defense contractor with eight deployments to Afghanistan. He is a Medal of Valor recipient for his bravery beyond the call of duty in law enforcement. Chad has also earned an MBA from New York Institute of Technology and is a board-certified pastoral counselor with a focus on PTSD. Chad Robichaud is married to his lovely wife, Kathy. They have one daughter, two sons, and two granddaughters. Here now is the final installment of Dr. Tim Clinton's conversation with Chad Robichaud on today's edition of Family Talk. Chad, welcome back to Family Talk. Uh, you know, it's been an amazing conversation over the last couple of days. I couldn't wait for today's broadcast. I want to talk a little bit more about PTSD and the amazing work that God's doing in and through your ministries. But Chad, again, so appreciate you joining us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me back on. It's been a, I'm really enjoying uh, getting to share, you know, all the different components of the story and just uh, hopefully uh, praying it's encouraging people. Chad, when you were in Afghanistan and you were talking about your eight deployments, there was a time when you began to ask yourself, am I becoming a monster? Chad, you come home and you've got a couple of horrific scenes that happened in your own life. Maybe you could take us there and begin to help us understand PTSD a little better. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the lack of empathy I had, the, the cold kind of coldness, and just not being emotionally moved by things. When you start recognizing that, it makes you feel like, am I a monster? Why don't I feel anymore? Uh, this this may, maybe feels like it works in Afghanistan, but now I'm home in an argument with my wife and I'm being berating her and, uh, and I don't even feel bad. My wife's crying. I don't even feel bad. Like, what's, what's wrong with me? Uh, that you can't feel that emotion anymore. Uh, it was one time, uh, you know, my, my little girl was so excited. I was going to be home for her birthday party. And to her, it's like, she's like, the birthday party's everything. She even has her half birthday, which I didn't know was a thing until I had a daughter. And, uh, you know, she's like a self-proclaimed princess. And, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it was a special day. And, and she's having her birthday party, and she's very opinionated. That's just who my daughter is. And she didn't like the icing on her cake, like something super simple. And I just lost my mind, and I, I, I flipped out and grabbed a, a handful of my little girl's birthday cake and picked it up and threw it against the wall and destroyed my little girl's birthday. And, you know, there was just so many moments like that. I remember being, like, at a traffic light with my wife, and my wife said something, and my three kids are in the back seat, and we were arguing in, uh, in, at this red light, and my kids are scared, and I start kicking in the dashboard, and uh, my wife tries to drive off, and I tried to kick the gear shift off the car so she couldn't drive off and I was just so out of control and so I think when I start recognizing those behaviors of being out of control the response for me was instead of it were correcting my behavior I needed to distance myself from my family because in my mind I was justified I need to be this way right now I need to be mean I need to be violent I need to be able to uh, not have emotion to do my job and I could fix this later on uh, there is no later on. It's it just going it, to, those things, that man, that anger and frustration and a lack of empathy and the, those physiological responses, uh, they only grow and get worse. And, you know, for me, that's when I start feeling this numbness in my arms and face and my throat would feel like a swelling shut and I feel like I had a thousand pounds on my chest. These, these things started to manifest in me early on. But I thought if I would speak up about it, people would think I was weak and push me out of my community and lose my clearance for going to a, uh, my top secret clearance for going to a psychologist. So I just kept it to myself and never got well. And obviously those things manifested in the way that they did. And, uh, and, you know, almost cost me everything by not addressing it. The mind can be a very free, beautiful place, Chad, or it can become a very dark, turbulent place. And when this thing starts spinning away from you, you can even go to a place where you think the world would be better off without you. I know you talked yesterday a little bit about going to that place. Pretty horrific journey. Chad, in the midst of it, God used your wife, showed up on the scene, 
and basically challenged you in a way that you hurt her. Uh, she said, are you a quitter? Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty kind of all-in or all-out person. I'm kind of make radical decisions. Uh, so when she made that challenge to me and I responded to that challenge and said, yeah, you know, she's right. I've been successful in professional things in my life, but when it came to the most important things, I quit. Uh, in that moment, I made that radical decision to get well. Uh, and then, you know, there was the mentorship of Steve, the surrendering my life to Christ. But beyond the decision, I think it's important to say that I didn't just surrender my life to Christ. I went in this very intentional discipleship uh, period with Steve for about a year. And through that process, what I discovered was that all these bad things that happened to me in my childhood in Afghanistan, all these bad things, as bad as those things were, those things didn't lead me to be in that closet with my pistol in my hand. What led me there were the choices that I made in response to those things. And, uh, and that's, it may sound cliche to some people to hear, but, uh, but it was very profound to me to realize I didn't have to let my past define my future. I could choose a different future moving forward. And the decisions that I made really uh, produced a result that I got in my life. And so I came to this conclusion that I needed to make better choices to fix my situation, which sounds simple, but to me it was profound. And, uh, and, but I didn't have a good set of choices. I just had bad habits that I was doing. And so what the Bible became to me was a way to pause and go to the Bible for an answer to each behavior. Did I still get angry? Did I still get frustrated? Did I still have panic attacks? Of course I did. But instead of choosing the old behaviors, I went to the Bible for a new behavior. And I was very intentional about putting these new behaviors in my life. And that resulted in a profound change in my life, which brought restoration, which brought hope again. And ultimately, it manifested in me finding that new purpose that we talked about uh, with Mark Twain, that the, the very purpose that I believe God created me to live in. And, uh, and, uh, and the reason why God allowed me to go through some of these things that he allowed me to go through was uh, to have that purpose. And that purpose manifested for me in a deep burden that God put in my heart to pay forward to others what Steve Toth had did for me. The challenge that Kathy gave me, uh, the, the mentorship that Steve gave me and the second chance that God gives us all, like I had to share that with others. I mean, it was like I was dying of cancer and Steve gave me the cure. I didn't want to share it. I felt obligated to share it. And, uh, and that manifested in the founding of Mighty Oaks Foundation and where my life has been committed to since for the last 12 years. Chad, I want to go back to your son, Hunter, just for a moment, too, because I found this really interesting. You heard that one in three children who lost a parent to suicide do what? Uh, take their lives as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I heard that statistic, and I remember thinking, like, man, uh, I have three children, and uh, if I take my life, the statistically, one of them will as well. I'm teaching, and that's the solution when life gets too hard. And, you know, my kids did everything that I did. I mean, they They've been wrestling since they could walk. They've been doing jujitsu since they could walk. I, I, you know, I, now they're adults and they want to do that. I'm, I'm a skydiver and now they want to skydive, which drives me crazy. I'm like, why do you guys want to do that? It's dangerous. And I've been, <laughs> I have like 500 jumps. And I'm like, and so, I mean, uh, so my kids do everything I do. And so like the thought of them, you know, yeah. facing hardships in their life, which they will, and seeing me take my life as a, a, as a solution and teaching them that is something that, that I really... Um, I'm thankfully I, I struggle with, and uh, but now you know they get to see someone that faced hardship. I get to talk to them about my failures, and tell them how it was difficult, but we worked through them. Chad, what's amazing is we've learned that when you experience trauma in your life, it can destroy your sense of safety. It's like you're waiting for the next proverbial shoe to drop. It's like the next bomb to go off. And it only makes sense when you start thinking the atrocities of war and you again experience or witness things that the human mind just doesn't assimilate in there. And so your natural response is to fight or to flight. And so you come back and speak a little bit about the reintegration process, too, because, again, I'm trying to make sure people understand why this is such an important issue for us to discuss, to move towards so we can help people like you guys are doing through Mighty Oaks Foundation. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the reintegration process is, I mean, for, for people to do it on their own, I don't know that people can really do it on their own. We weren't meant to do it on our own. God didn't design us to do it on our own. We meant to do it in community with others. And, and you know, that's why we, you know, I went through this situation. Now I'm able to pay forward those lessons to others. But to reintegrate like that, you're still feeling these emotional and physiological impacts. It's very difficult without the guidance and education. Uh, that's why I love what you guys do so much. It's very difficult without the guidance and education to be able to understand how to reintegrate, how to navigate, what's normal, what's not normal, what's, what's, a, what's a right response and behavior, what's okay, what's not okay. It's very difficult to understand that when you're doing it by yourself and you're all you can relate to is your own emotions and impulses. Uh, you have to have that outside education. And, uh, you know, the Bible does that very well, uh, but gives us that. But, the, you know, the context of, you know, counseling and biblical counseling and biblical mentorship 
relationship really brings that into practical reality. And, uh, you know, I can tell you, uh, this is something I'm very proud of and I'm not boasting on myself. This is, you know, Paul, boss Paul talks about it. If you're going to boast, boast on, boast on God. And this is a God boast. Like I found myself during these evacuations when we went back to rescue these people from Afghanistan. Uh, you know, we had did, we rescued the 17,000 people, but, uh, myself and a guy named Dennis Price, were going to fly into Tajikistan, spend 10 days on the border swim across the Panjir River every night in Afghanistan and the Taliban controls past Taliban scouts and everything. I'm 46 years, this was months ago. And, I, and I'm flying over there thinking, what if I get out in these mountains and something triggers me and the last time I was in Afghanistan, I have a panic attack. What if my blood pressure goes 200 over 130? What if I have a stroke? What if I'm a liability to my partner, Dennis, uh, in the middle of this, you know, going sneak back in Afghanistan to help evacuate these people? You know, God, what do you have me going here for? And as I'm thinking about this and, the enemy is speaking these lies into my, me that I'm still broken. I remember the last 12 years, and I've spoken to 300,000 active duty troops on spiritual resiliency and based around the world. And one of the things I teach them is, you know, mind, body, spirit, social, the four pillars of resiliency. And how, when I went to Afghanistan the first time, I was mentally tough, physically tough, socially I was with the best team, but I didn't have that spiritual pillar. And I talk about like a four-legged stool. All four of those legs represent one of those pillars, but one of them's weak, you sit in that chair, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna break and you're gonna fall down. I didn't have that spiritual pillar and because of that, I, I broke. But now I have that faith and resiliency through Christ and I can understand that going to a place like Afghanistan again, because God burdened my heart to be there, I need to put that faith on him. So I remember having this conversation with God on a flight to Tajikistan saying, God, you called me to wow. be here. I need you to take away any physiological responses uh, that my body's gonna have. Uh, and, and, uh, and I remember having that prayer and this peace came over me. I told Dennis on our layover and he's a Christian as well as we prayed together. And uh, we spent 10 days in Tajikistan. Every night we swam across the Panjir River into Afghanistan. It's like ice melt water. Taliban's like at some points like 30 yards away from us. And I say this complete humility, like I never felt fear, anxiety, stress come into me. Uh, there was one moment I knew we were gonna do something pretty crazy. I sat down and, and prayed Psalm 23, uh, I, I have it memorized uh, because it brings a lot of peace to me. And I remember praying that prayer and this peace just came over me and we ended up swimming across that river and right between a ch Chinese checkpoint and a Taliban checkpoint. And uh, there's just peace was over me. And I, and I remember thinking like, oh, I was in this river where I was years ago, moments to where I was going to the emergency room with blood pressure over 200 over 130, moments to where my wife would talk too loud and I would have like a, I couldn't take the stress and my wife talking too loud. Moments to where I couldn't even get in a car by myself and go to a gas station because I was in fear of, of being alone in fear of just dying at any moment. And now I'm in Afghanistan swimming past the Taliban. And uh, again, I say that not to brag about that operation at all. I say that to say God could heal the souls of people. And, uh, and PTSD, you want to know what PTSD really is. PTSD is a spiritual wound. It's a wound to the soul. And uh, you know, I'm not speaking against doctors and counselors and psychologists and medicine as a place for it all. But you can heal the mind and you can heal the body, but until you heal a person's soul, they're never truly gonna be well. And there's only one prescriptive way to heal someone's soul and that's through a relationship with Christ. And I believe you know, God allows me to still be here today to be a living testimony of that. And why he allowed this 46 year old washed up special operations guy to go to Afghanistan and do that. Maybe it's to come back and, uh, cause, and, and tell that story because four days after that river, I found myself at Marine Corps boot camp, San Diego. I flew straight there, spoke to 4,000 recruits, that same speech I gave for 12 years on spiritual resiliency, and it wasn't being taught from theory anymore. I'm like, I was just in this river, 30 yards away from the Taliban. And uh, because of my spiritual pillar, right? My mind not be, might be where it used to be, my body certainly isn't. And socially, I didn't have a big team. I had Dennis, I love the guy, but uh, he was just one person. But that spiritual pillar is the one I had to do this operation. And, uh, and I'm walking away a lot different than the first time I went to Afghanistan. Chad, I think you're speaking to a lot of people. I'm, I'm thinking about those who are listening who may have been hurt as a child. Maybe they were physically abused or sexually abused. Maybe they witnessed stuff that they shouldn't have witnessed. Or maybe they had some other trauma that they don't even speak about. And it tends to isolate them. They, it's 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 natural to kind of pull away uh, into your own world. And but that's where it kind of turns on us and devours us. Chad, I've heard people say the antidote to PTSD is relationship. You've got to move in a different direction. A lot of what you've talked about is 
that healing relationship with God in Christ. I mean, you moved into that. And then you, by the way, began to go on a journey in your discipleship and take a look at biblical stories. You love the story of David and Jonathan and how meaningful it was. Chad, talk to us and speak to the people who are hurting. Maybe they know someone right now who is in a spin. What do you say to them? And how do you strengthen their heart? What can they do? Where do they go? What? Goodness, there's so much help that's needed out there. There is, and one, I think the most important thing is to, that people, and if you're struggling, you know someone's struggling, the first thing is, is there is hope. It feels hopeless in that moment. You're like, it's going to be this way forever. you convince convincing your mind this is how it's always yeah. going to be. That's not true. That's a lie of the enemy. It will not be that way forever. There is hope. Uh, hope, and I think God brings the first form of hope in the form of relationships. And you are not meant to do this alone. You don't have to do this alone. Even if you're alone right now in your house listening to this and there's no, you feel like there's no family or friends around, go to a church. Uh, go to a good church in your community and, be, and just be open with someone. The things you're struggling with, you think you're the only one. No one feels this way. No one's ever felt so hopeless that they want to take their lives. The truth is many people feel that way. And, uh, and, and speak it out. No matter how bad it is, no matter how embarrassing it is, speak it out to someone and it, it frees that captive thought that the devil wants to keep uh, you isolated in. You have to speak it out to community and to others. Uh, so this, uh, I'll go through a couple of things you could do in the list. One is medication, right? I speak a lot against medication because I believe people over medicate it. The average person that comes to Mighty Oaks is on, you know, 15 to 20 pills a day for PTSD with no other diagnosis. You know, you can't heal if you can't feel. You have to be able to feel. But... I will say there is a time and place for, for sure. medications. Uh, you know, God created doctors and... The right doctors. medications at the right time, Chad. The, you know, the right amounts. You got it. Med management. It's important. It should be a pit stop in your road to recovery and That's not your right. destination. If, if medication is the only part of your plan, then it's a bad plan. Uh, second is counseling. Uh, another thing is uh, speaking about it. Uh, whether it's publicly or one-on-one, -on -one, you need to speak about your issues with someone and get connected with a group that you can speak about it. Um, and then uh, one of the other things you could do is get engaged in activity that stimulates your mind and body. For me, it's jujitsu. Uh, I like some physical activities to stimulate your mind and body. We call this replacement conditioning, replacing kind of negative behaviors with something positive that you have in the queue to do. And then lastly, I'll, I'll say this, uh, educate yourself on the physiological effects of trauma. Chad, we're um, basically out of time, but you wrote a book that I think is really the theme of the last three days. Uh, an unfair advantage. Chad, in the middle of it, it's just all about our relationship with God in Christ, that he is the ultimate source of our strength. And he's the one who brings healing in the midst of the most insane chaos uh, that we may experience in this life. Chad, I want you to close out by just um, sharing that piece and how you're doing, how your family is, as we wrap up uh, this three-part series with you. Yeah, and Unfair Advantage is one of my you know, favorite books uh, to, to write. And I, I look, go back and read it now, and I'm like, I can't believe I wrote that. And, uh, God just really spoke to me through writing that book. And it's just stories of, uh, of my time in Afghanistan and life and biblical stories that really inspired me. And the truth is we do have, when we're in a relationship with Christ and we live in life the way he created us to live, we have an, an unfair advantage over everything that we're going to face. And, uh, and we will come out on this side in the right place. Um, today, my family is doing amazing. I've been married 27 years. Uh, all three of my children are married. Two of them went to Bible college. Two of them went in the Marines. Two of them work for our ministry. And I have two, I have a grandbaby and one grandbaby on the way. Um, Mighty Oaks is doing amazing. We've had 4,500 graduates from our program. Uh, I've spoken over 300,000 active duty troops, given away about 200,000 copies of our books. Uh, and we're over in Ukraine right now working. Uh, Save Our Allies is doing amazing as well. And, uh, and then I have another book coming out in January called Saving Aziz, which is a story of the Afghanistan rescues and going to get Aziz as well as the 17,000 others. And it's on pre-sale, available now. Savingaziz.org is the website for that. Chad, I know as we wrap up, you want to see a generation of men who are strong, who are courageous for such a time as this. As a matter of fact, uh, your son Hunter joined the Marine Corps just like his daddy all the way through that family system. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, I love the story where your dad said, Hunter, when he was at boot camp, he said, ah, they're going to make a man out of him. Your response was? Yeah, he's already a man. Uh, I mean, I mean, Hunter is Hunter's a man. That, uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, that's a big question in people's lives and men's lives is like, when did you become a man? And I think most men try to attribute it to 
uh, like a, a moment, like a, you know, the first time I had sex or the first time I had a job or the first time I, you know, did a certain thing, like or got married. That I think but being a man is when you realize that life's not about you, it's about others. And uh, that's being a man. Chad, we're so uh, honored that you'd spend uh, this precious time with us and to share your story. And I know people, again, are going to want to know how um, they can learn more about you, how maybe they can sponsor the Mighty Oaks Foundation, the work you're doing with veterans and more. Could you share that with them? Yeah, MightyOaksPrograms.org is the website for all things Mighty Oaks. You could uh, you could support our efforts with the U.S. service members here, our efforts internationally in places like Ukraine. Uh, we have, we're have we putting 1,000 people through our program a year, We and we do that all for free. So we pay for everything, about $4 million a year in programming that is paid for by a great foundation of supporters that get these guys through a program. We pay for their flights and everything. Uh, and, I, and it helps me go to bases around the world and speak to our troops, uh, as well as give them out books and things like that, and resources. Uh, so you can support there. And Unfair Advantage is available on our websites or on anywhere books are sold. Again, Saving Aziz is uh, coming out in January. Pre, it's up for pre-sales. And uh, we'd love to support the people to get a copy of that book. Uh, Chad, I can't wait for you to join us at the Ignite Men's Impact Weekend in March of 2023 in Lynchburg, Virginia. So it's going to be, hey, we're going to have a lot of fun there, Chad. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I obviously missed last year for Ukraine. Uh, yeah. But uh, and yeah, I know you guys are praying for me when we went out there. But um, I'm looking forward to it this year. It's going to be a, it's gonna be amazing. Can't wait. Our special guest, again, has been Chad Robichaud. Chad's a former Force Recon Marine and Department of Defense contractor with eight deployments into Afghanistan as a part of a Joint Special Operations Command Task Force. He's the founder of the Mighty Oaks Foundation, a leading, amazing nonprofit serving active duty military veteran and first responder communities around the world with highly successful faith-based combat trauma and resiliency programs. He's also the co-founder of Save Our Allies. That's a nonprofit mission focused on the evacuation and recovery of Americans, allies, and vulnerable people trapped in Afghanistan. Chad, I think uh, probably a beautiful way to close would be to share a verse that's in your heart, and that's Proverbs 31, 8, and 9. We need to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly and defend the rights of the poor and the needy, the broken. Chad, it's been a delight on behalf of Dr. Dobbs and his wife, Shirley, their family, the entire Family Talk crew. We thank you and we salute you. God be with you. Give you strength. Thank you. God bless. Incredible conversation between Dr. Tim Clinton and his guest, former U.S. Marine and Medal of Valor recipient Chad Robichaud here on Family Talk. Today's program was the third and final installment of Dr. Clinton's conversation with Chad. He had so many incredible stories and a heartfelt testimony of surviving PTSD and then thriving on the other side. Remember, if you missed any part of this three-part program, just visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash Family Talk. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. Or you can send us an email at constituentcare at drjamesdobson.org. And don't forget, if you haven't signed up for Dr. Dobson's newsletter, I'd like to encourage you to do that today. In that newsletter, Dr. Dobson tackles newsworthy topics and offers advice and encouragement for families in every stage of life. To sign up to receive Dr. Dobson's newsletter via email or through the U.S. mail, visit drjamesdobson.org or give us a call at 877-732-6825. Finally, September is National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Here at Family Talk, we know that sometimes life can seem too dark to bear, but the fact is there is help and there is hope. If you or someone you know is in a mental health crisis, you can call this number, 988 Again, that number is 988, and it connects you directly with the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Again, that national toll-free number is 988 to reach a trained crisis worker who will listen to you, understand how your problem is affecting you, and provide support and then help you to get the help that you need. Well, thanks for listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk today. If you've been blessed by what you've heard and would like to support our ministry, remember you can always make a donation online at drjamesdobson.org or give us a call at 877-732-6825. 
I'm Roger Marsh. And from all of us here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, thanks so much for listening to Family Talk. Until next time, may God continue to richly bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hey, everyone. Did you know that radio is more popular now than ever? A new feature here at Family Talk we're excited to announce. It's called the Station Finder feature. This is Dr. Tim Clinton for Family Talk. I want to tell you how you can listen to our daily broadcast on a station near you. Go to the broadcast menu at drjamesdobson.org.org, then click on the Family Talk radio stations button. Once you're there, you're going to see an interactive map of radio affiliates, which, by the way, is growing every day. Simply click on your home state, and then you'll see where our broadcast is airing in your town. Stop randomly spinning around the dial, hoping to find Dr. Dobson and Family Talk. Go to drjamesdobson.org and take advantage of this brand new Station Finder feature.